Let's start right here by talking about some things as Christians that we know to be true that aren't spelled out in words in the Bible, such as the word Trinity. We will not find that word in the scriptures, but we know that to be true of God, that God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. We know that to be true, okay? Another question that I've gotten from time to time, even here online, is why do you say plead the blood of Jesus? I've had people message me on Messenger and say, will you message me the scripture that tells you to plead the blood of Jesus Christ? To plead the blood of Jesus Christ against demons. Where do you see that, Pastor? Well, it's much like the Trinity. You put these pieces together and understand what they are and what they mean. That is what gives you clarity in a situation. It's when you put the various pieces together in the Bible. You don't have to have it spelled out for you where it says, and Jesus says to plead my blood. Because we wouldn't start pleading the blood of Jesus until after Jesus was crucified, buried in the tomb, and rose from the dead. And that's a fact. But we do understand a lot about the shed blood of Jesus. We have a complete teaching on all the benefits of the shed blood of Jesus on that cross. But we're going to go just a little bit deeper here today. And I want to just explain to you the power of pleading the blood of Jesus. Why does the enemy hate it so much? Let me just start right there. Just us talking right here, y'all. Why does Satan hate it so much when you plead the blood of Jesus, first of all, against him? Because it is a reminder of his defeat. He knows that he's been defeated. He's very well aware of that. He's lost the keys. So he understands that. But when you plead the blood of Jesus Christ against him, you are literally declaring that victory that took place on that cross through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And that is a fact. And when you plead the blood of Jesus Christ for protection over your children, over your family, over yourself, over your home, that's biblical. Because there is protection in the blood of Jesus. Why? Because when we look at when we look at Passover and the blood of that sacrificed lamb was placed in that basin, the only remedy for protection was to take that blood and put it over the door and then stay under the blood by staying in the house. That is in the Old Testament. The Passover lamb is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you stay under the blood, walking in the light, he is faithful and just to cleanse you from all sins and from all unrighteousness. That is 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. But we're going to go all the way back to the beginning here. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning because many of you in here have heard me preach the gospel numerous times. I say to folks, let me tell you a story. I want to tell them a story very compact and I want to tell them the story of Jesus and why the world required a savior. And I have to really condense it down to about just a few minutes, maybe five, maybe just a little longer sometimes. And we've seen many, many people give their life to Jesus in here and get saved and get born again for real. And I explain one of the one of the sentences that I say when I tell that story. Is that ever since the fall of man. Or I usually say it like this. It wasn't long after man sinned. That we began to sacrifice animals on this earth. And I explain the historical basis for that archaeologists, scientists, the Bible, so on and so forth. So let's go back for a moment here. Somebody dropped this in the chat. Let's go back here for a moment. And we're going to go back 
to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to start here at verse 7. Somebody drop that in the chat right now. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. I believe this. you're going to be blessed by this powerful revelation of the Holy Spirit. By the end of tonight's teaching, you are going to understand the power and the blood of Jesus. If you're on Facebook and you can visit YouTube and Facebook as well at the same time, that would be awesome. If you can continue to drop comments and thumbs up and things like that on Facebook and YouTube, I would appreciate that. OK, just just putting that out there because we could reach more more people, more people with this powerful message tonight. There's a lot of Christian folks out there that just don't have this type of information. We want them to have it. We want them to have this revelation from the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to read here from Genesis chapter three, verse seven. Then the eyes now. Now, let me tell you what happened here. They've sinned. They have partaken of that forbidden fruit. They have sinned. At this point, they have disobeyed God. They have been rebellious. You can you can literally equate the word sin with rebellious. When we say we were born with a sinful nature because of Adam, we were born with a rebellious nature because of Adam. Okay, you don't have to teach a little baby to try to grab a toy from another little baby because they like the toy that the other little baby's got more than the one that they got. We were all born with this rebellious nature. I don't care how good of a kid they are. Now, right here, chapter 3, verse 7. Watch this now. Then the eyes of both of them, that's Adam and Eve, were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. So they see immediately that they're naked. They understand that it's probably not proper to be walking around naked like that. And they sewed some fig leaves together for clothing. Now, hold on right there. Go over to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 21. Somebody drop this in there right now. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Now they've had a talk with God. Now God's come and they're hiding because they're naked. And God sees them, has a little talk with them, pronounces some curses. And by all rights, because they were rebellious against God, the penalty for that, ready, is death. How do we know that? Because God told them before they ever took of that fruit. If you go back in Genesis chapter 2, put your finger right there on verse 21. You go back to chapter 2. Let me find this verse right here, y'all, because it gets it gets to getting a little bit crazy there when we get way back in there. Let's look over here. He tells them right here, Genesis chapter 2. Let's go to verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. God says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Now listen to this. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. Who created that? Who made that rule right there? Who created that? God did. God said that. Satan didn't create death. Mm -mm. No. He tempted them into rebellion against God, which triggered something that God had already created, and God cannot break his word. And God created death. And he said, listen to me, whoever eats of this tree will die. Now. They go in to eat of the tree. They're found to be naked. They cover themselves with fig leaves. And over here, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Somebody drop it in there. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Okay. 
Let me explain something here. Through the Holy Ghost, I pray that everybody can receive this immediately. Immediately, God instituted this one spiritual principle. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Without the covering of blood, there's no protection whatsoever. They, Adam and Eve, covered themselves with plants. Yeah, they covered themselves with plants when they found out they were naked. They covered themselves with leaves. God comes on the scene, explains to them the severity of everything they've done. And what does God do? God clothes them with blood. He clothes them with animal skins. He's saying, I'm supposed to be killing you right now. Put this on. You think them animal skins was all dried out and tailored real good like we see in the movies and all that? No. It was a bloody mess. He said, that's what you're going to wear right now. These bloody animal skins. It's not a movie. This is real Bible talk here. This is what you're going to wear. You can see later on in the Old Testament when the priests, when they would sacrifice a lamb, they'd take that blood and they'd smear it all on their ear. And they'd put it on their thumb and they'd put it on their toe to be covered in that blood. You think they walked around looking pretty with that blood? That's Hollywood. This is not. This is reality. Now watch this because we're going to talk about the blood of Jesus here in a moment and why you plead the blood of Jesus for protection over your family. So here they go. Who, who covers them? Who covers them with the animal skins and the blood? My Bible said the Lord did. I pray that that's what your Bible says as well. Now let's continue on. Chapter 4. We come across two of their children, Cain and Abel. Now watch what happens here. I'm going to go down here to the second part of verse 2. Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, second part. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. So here comes brother Cain. He is bringing an offering to the Lord. He is a farmer. He's got tons of fruits and vegetables, and he's bringing it all to the Lord. He's coming with a lot of it, and he's bringing it to the Lord. Abel comes along. He's got the firstborn. One. He's got, a, he's got a lamb. I believe it was a lamb. He's bringing one only. Cain's got a lot of different plants and uh, everything else that he's planted. Abel comes along and says he brings, he brought this firstborn. And the Lord, second part of verse four, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Now. What did Adam and Eve try to cover their self with? What did they try to cover their self with? Somebody please drop this in there right now. Anita Nelson, we were at Genesis chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Somebody put this in there right now that I know that everybody's locked in on this because it's very important. When you're just saying things out in the atmosphere, it doesn't do anything. We've talked about that in here. We preachers can read right out of the Bible to the congregation and nothing happens. The word profited them nothing because it was not mixed with faith. That's in your Bible. The word profited them nothing because it was not mixed with faith. It's got to be mixed with faith. So you need to know why are you doing these things? What were they covered with? Leaves. Yes, indeed. Leaves and plants. Leaves. Yes. God said, no, 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 no. We're going to cover you with blood and animal skins. Here we go. Here we go, y'all. So here comes Cain and Abel. Cain's coming with all these plants. Leaved plants, I guarantee you. Some of them had leaves on them. Carrots and, and peas and mushrooms and Cabbage and everything else. 
And Abel comes with a blood sacrifice. And God says, that I accept, and this I do not. Do you see it? Please tell me that you see what's happened right here. That God, in his, in his infinite wisdom, has established something since the original sin. He put it in place. He says, by all rights, I'm supposed to be killing you right now. But because you're covered with this blood, there's a pass. So when we go on into the Old Testament and we see that every year, year after year after year, they would sacrifice these animals for the forgiveness of sins of the people. Every year. Sprinkling that blood every year for the forgiveness of sins of the people. And we talk about this. But it all started way back in that garden. God is the one. That gave the, them them animal skins to cover with. Anybody in here ever skinned an animal? Or been around people that ever skinned an animal, right? You killed a deer. You killed an elk. You killed something. You skinned it. Is it bloody? It's bloody. I want everybody to understand that's bloody. Okay? But there was a reason that God was doing this. Because in his infinite wisdom, he had always prepared this one sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world for all time. But that sacrifice wouldn't be perfected unless there was the shedding of blood. And they literally ripped Jesus' skin open with whips that had pieces of metal and bone in them and everything else. And they hit him and they jerked it. Romans were good at this. They knew what they was doing. Blood, blood, bloody mess. The Bible says you couldn't recognize him. You couldn't even recognize Jesus when they took him to the cross. And they went up there and they put those spikes through his hands and his feet and more blood. More blood. And then after he was dead, they hit him with a spear in the side and more blood. You get in the picture. The only victory that we have is through Jesus' blood, through his death, burial, and resurrection. It's through his shed blood that we have victory. It's through his shed blood that we are saved and born again. These are the facts. It might sound a little bit gruesome. It might not sound all that pretty, but I'm going to tell you something. It's beautiful. You know why? You've heard the old hymn, there's power in the blood. We've done a lot of deliverance, y'all. We've done a ton of deliverance in the last seven, eight months. When you are in there casting a the devil out, and it's a battle. Sometimes it is a battle when you're casting out demons. One of the things that I've learned that is extremely effective is you remind them that they are subject to you in the name of Jesus and that they were defeated through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You can even ask them that. I don't recommend any of y'all get out there and get to talking to demons. I have talked to some when necessary. It's not my favorite thing to do. And you can tell them, you can ask them, you were defeated through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, weren't you? They'll be quiet. Make them, make them, give me an answer now. Say it now. You were defeated through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Say it now. In the name of Jesus, I command you to say it. You'll be surprised at what comes out of that mouth. They know it and they hate it. Okay? So we've got that established. So when we are pleading the blood of Jesus Christ, against these demons and against Satan, it's like we are hitting him with a whip. And I've explained that in here many times where I've been doing a deliverance and I just keep saying that over and over and they just keep screaming out like they're getting just, just whipped. The same way that Jesus got hit with a whip. 
Somebody needs to say amen, man. If y'all, somebody's got to say hallelujah to that because that is straight from the Holy Spirit of God. I'm telling you, I pray that there will come a time where we'll all be able to fellowship together and people will come in and we can do deliverance right there when people need it. We're not looking for demon under every rock or shadow and we don't believe every problem is caused by a demon. But when you see that and you see me in operation doing that, when I'm pleading the blood of Jesus Christ against them, it's as if those same whips that were hitting Jesus's back is hitting those demons and they don't like it. They let you know they do not like that. Why? Because it was that shed blood that guaranteed the victory of Jesus and that guaranteed the victory for us on this earth through that shed blood of Jesus. So, first off, number one, when you plead the blood of Jesus Christ against demons, against satanic forces and principalities, you plead the blood of Jesus Christ against them and then you hit them with a command because you have authority in the name of Jesus to do that. They are subject to you in the name of Jesus. That is that's like a jab and a right hook, a jab, pop, and then the right hook, pop. They out of there. Trust me, we've done more than I can count. That's what it is. It's a combination. It's a combination. Now, when you plead the precious protective blood of Jesus over your family and over yourself, you can see throughout Scripture. That Adam and Eve were protected from that that punishment that belonged to them by the skins that the Lord provided. Abel's sacrifice was honored, which was a blood sacrifice, an offering. And when the priest would take that blood from that basin and sprinkle it into that, in the Holy of Holies once a year. It guaranteed forgiveness of sins for all the people for that year. And at Passover, the instruction was take the blood out of the basin. While the blood is in the basin, it's doing no good. Jesus has died on the cross. That's a fact. It was a perfect sacrifice. Guaranteed perfect. Nothing could be added or taken away from it. But just having that knowledge does you no good. Just having that knowledge as a Christian doesn't make you automatically protected. Oh, no. You got to take the blood out of the basin, just like they had to do at Passover. The responsibility was on them. Take the lamb, sacrifice the bloods in the basin, but you have to apply the blood. You still got to take it out of there with the hyssop plant over the lintel and the doorpost. You have to do that, and then you got to stay up under the blood. Same way with the blood of Jesus. As a Christian, you've got to partake of that blood, take that blood, and apply it and all the benefits of that blood, including protection, by pleading that blood over your life and over the lives of your family members. You are releasing into the spiritual realm the authority and the power in the blood of Jesus. It's very important. It's very, very important. And you know what Jesus did? Because it's so important that the very last meal that he had on this earth, he said, check this out, y'all. He hadn't done this like this before. It's not recorded in the Bible that he did. But on the last meal, he said, do this. Take this bread, break it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Yeah. Yeah. Take this cup, which is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. It is shed for the forgiveness of sins of many. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is a weapon as a Christian that you've got to have in the quiver, in your arrow quiver. This is one right here that you always need to have at your disposal. And I'm going to tell you right now, the old school Pentecostals, the old school ones back in the day, they had a revelation about this. They had a revelation about the blood of Jesus. They really did. I believe part of that revelation sparked the tent revivals in the 1940s in the United States. 
They had a revelation about the power of the blood of Jesus. They would plead the blood of Jesus over everything. They plead the blood of Jesus over your kid's pillow, over your kid's backpack. They plead the blood of Jesus over your kid's lunch pail. They didn't have backpacks back then. Lunch pail. They're pleading the blood of Jesus over the kid's shoes and the blood of Jesus over the, the horse carriage. Man, they were some blood pleading fools. Guaranteed. But they knew there was something to it. They had the revelation so they could mix their faith with that word. And it was effective and it was effective against the enemy. There's a lot of talk about the blood of Jesus. But the folks have that revelation and understand that you can be pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over your animals. Oh, yeah. You don't think God protected the animals of the uh, people of Israel? Of course he did. Did he protect their crops? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, he did. The blood of the lamb. Listen to me. Revelation 12, 11. Everybody grab this right now. And when you grab this, now we're going to make, after this, we're going to make a proclamation in the name of Jesus. Revelation 12, 11. They defeated Satan. Through the blood of the Lamb and their testimony. That is the blood of Jesus. That is the blood of Jesus. You know what John the Baptist called Jesus as soon as, I mean, I'm talking about the revelation that John had. Because he directly revealed the Lord Jesus Christ to be who he is. It's the reason that Jesus said, among those born, none is greater than John the Baptist. Because John was in the Jordan and Jesus walked by and, and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. It's through that shed blood that we have victory. It's through that shed blood that you know that you can plead the blood of Jesus over your children, over your home, over your vehicle. You can plead the blood of Jesus over yourself for protection and all the benefits of his shed blood, which we've discussed in a separate video for an hour and a half. Sanctification, access to the father, seven, sevenfold uh, redemption through the blood of Jesus that we discussed in that video. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And as a weapon against Satan, plead the blood of Jesus against him. Rebuke him and command him to flee from you in Jesus' name. It is a one-two punch that he cannot stand because that is where the defeat took place through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So, everybody up. Praise God. We're going to do a proclamation together right now. There's tremendous power in proclamation. The scripture in the Bible says you will proclaim a thing and it will be done for you. Everybody up. If y'all can get up right now in the name of Jesus, let's proclaim this right now. Everybody, I'll say it and then you say it. Okay. In the name of Jesus. And through the blood of Jesus. I have victory on this earth. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ against all demons and all satanic assignments that have come against me. I command you to leave me now in Jesus' name. I am a child of God, I am a son of God, and I am God's favorite because I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name, praise God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy